Last week, I opened the show with a heartfelt sadness that an important launch was scheduled for Christmas Eve with backup dates of Christmas Day and Boxing Day. And I didn't really want to be covering breaking news on the holidays again. While I've never been one to believe that you can just put an idea out into the world and have it manifest, coincidences do happen. About the time that episode made it to our patrons' inboxes for early access, an announcement hit my inbox that ULA's Vulcan Rocket's debut launch with Astrobiotics Peregrine Lander has been delayed to no earlier than the January launch window, which starts January 8th. I deeply hope this gives everyone on the Space Coast and in the space communications family, a chance to kick back and write things that aren't breaking news while enjoying whatever seasonally available treats they may desire. And in addition to somehow manifesting no Christmas Day launch, just as we were going live with this recording, or at least just as we were hitting record with this recording, I got news that that volcano, Grindavik, in Iceland, that I had literally given up on, it started erupting north of the city. So, so far, as far as I know, town is safe, volcano is erupting. All right, around CosmoQuest and our EVSN production team, the holidays are going to mean Minecraft, gaming, and putting together our lists of this year's favorite weird and wonderful science news. I know what my stories are going to be, but what are yours? Let us know in the YouTube comments to this video and get your favorite stories considered for our first episode of 2024. As for this episode, well, as the Thanksgiving leftovers reach the stage of possibly gaining intelligence in the back of my refrigerator, we're going to take a look at the origins of life, how we might find simple life on icy moons, and even how we can practice learning to communicate with other civilizations by chatting up humpback whales. All this and more is coming to you right here, right now, on Escape Velocity Space News. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. One of the great unknowns of nearly the past 100 years is the identity of the invisible stuff that makes up the bulk of the matter in our galaxy and others. Called dark matter, this stuff is able to exert gravitational pulls, but doesn't absorb, emit, or reflect light. We can see where dark matter is located from its gravitational pull, but that doesn't let us see what it is. Current theories don't quite explain the new details about our universe, that we're learning from Webb's images of the earliest galaxies or studies of modern galaxies that find the variability in the amount of dark matter exceeds the variability expected from our current theory, which is called cold dark matter. And when one theory doesn't quite match reality, new theories get explored. It turns out the two greatest limitations on our ability to understand our universe are the technologies we use to run our models and the creativity of the theorists who come up with those theories for the models. In a new paper in the Astrophysical Journal by Ethan Nagler, Deneg Yang, and He Ba Yu, they show that they have the creativity to take our understanding potentially one step forward. 
Specifically, they asked what would happen if dark matter particles have the capacity to self-interact. This means that while most particles we're used to may not interact with dark matter particles, dark matter particles will interact with other dark matter particles. According to Nagler, quote, these self-interactions lead to heat transfer in the halo, which diversifies the halo density in the central regions of galaxies. In other words, some halos have higher central densities and others have lower central densities compared to their cold dark matter counterparts, with details depending on the cosmic evolution history and environments of individual halos." End quote. Self-interacting dark matter isn't totally new, but this paper introduces some new details. They make the dark matter strongly interacting and explore the extremes of low mass galaxies with a lot of dark matter and with a very low proportion of dark matter. They found they could successfully reproduce the actual systems we see, which isn't possible with the standard cold dark matter model or other variations of the interacting dark matter model. This isn't the team's first paper on strongly interacting dark matter. Across a series of papers, they have worked to define their theory and then apply it to different scenarios, including the diversity of dark matter halos found around galaxies near the Milky Way. This work will need to be replicated by other teams and applied to additional populations of objects before it can become a leading theory. But this research has my attention and we'll be following their progress. One factor upping the difficulty of understanding our universe is the complexity of our universe. It sometimes feels like every time we think we're getting a handle on how things work, some new data set comes along and says, but can you explain this? As it reveals new objects or old objects in new numbers. For instance, we thought we had a pretty good handle on stellar evolution and what kinds of star deaths we should be able to see. But then the universe said, here are some supernovae that don't have enough hydrogen, explain this. A typical star starts and ends its life with an outer atmosphere made primarily of hydrogen. Stars with eight solar masses or less will generally puff this off and form a planetary nebula as the core settles into being a hot white dwarf. Larger stars will explode, sending their hydrogen-rich atmosphere outwards with fury as the core collapses into a neutron star, black hole, or an energy-filled nothing. To get supernovae without hydrogen? Well, that requires some gravitational help from a friend. In binary star systems, it is possible for a star to expand out until its outer atmosphere gets close enough to its neighbor that the neighbor can gravitationally strip off the hydrogen. This will create one star with no hydrogen atmosphere and one with way too much hydrogen in its atmosphere. Both stars will now experience an evolution unlike anything our single star models could ever predict. And this binary star solution seems to work in computers. In the actual universe, researchers have struggled to find systems with the stars needed to explain all the observed hydrogen-poor supernovae. But in a new paper in the journal Science that is led by Maria Drought, researchers observe 25 stars in the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, a pair of nearby galaxies easily seen from the Southern Hemisphere. They found that eight of these 24 stars were binary systems in which one of the two stars is a hydrogen-poor core left behind when the other star stole its atmosphere. These stars, hiding in the light of their parasitic companion, should exist in the needed numbers to explain all the hydrogen-poor super supernovae. Once again, the universe has said, explain this. And science has had, with a bit of searching, a good-looking answer. Go science. 
There is a not subtle difference between a theory that explains what we see and a believable theory that explains what we see. Right now, if we go outside and look at the expansion rate of our universe based on our observations of the early universe and based on our observations of the modern universe, we will get two somewhat different values, with our modern universe appearing to expand faster than it should. This discrepancy is called the Hubble Tension, and a new paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society by Sergej Mazenko has tried to explain this as the result of our galaxy and local group being precisely located within a void surrounded by a region of higher density that is just beyond what we're able to see. In this theory, we live in a special place in the universe that allows us to see everything around us moving away just that much faster because of the pull of unseen mass outside the observable universe. And it is that special place requirement that makes this theory not that great. As a first principle, cosmologists posit that we live in neither a special time or special place and that what we see here should be the same everywhere. While we do acknowledge that we live in a fairly nice several billion year span, a time where there's just the right amount of stuff forming just the right kinds of stars, that a level of special we can live with allows us to live, eh, that's okay. But saying we are precisely in the middle of some unseen void, that takes it a step too far for many. But the theory works. So the real question needs to be, is there a better theory? Sometimes explaining our universe and knowing we got it right just feels harder than it should be. But as hard as it is to explain the universe, explaining life is even harder. Up next, we look at the problems of searching for life and then of trying to communicate with it. Stay tuned. The more we explore our own planet, the more weird places we find life. From colonies growing up around deep ocean hydrothermal vents to microbes living in the soils revealed in deep earth mines. Over and over, we keep finding that wherever we explore, life has found a way. These discoveries have forced us to update our understanding of what it takes for life to exist. Once we thought the list was water, sunlight, and food. Today, we know reality is a bit more flexible. Sure, water is good, but we now think any chemical solvent will work. While my plants and I require sunlight, a lot of critters do perfectly fine in perfect darkness. It turns out life needs a source of energy, and the sun really isn't the only power plant around. And food? Food is still required, but we're learning that food can be any old suite of molecules a life form can metabolize to move, grow, and thrive. A solvent, an energy source, and nutrients. Those are the real requirements for life, and they can be found on worlds far outside the habitable zone where liquid water can exist on a planet's surface. It turns out life in general is a lot less limited than life like us. With our solar system, the most likely other places for life aren't actually planets like Mars. While it's totally possible subsurface moisture and molecules may support microbial life, this kind of an existence isn't what many of us are hoping for. The real exciting places to look are the currently impossible to reach oceans on Worlds like Europa, and Enceladus, and even Pluto. Beneath thick icy shells, each of these worlds is home to vast oceans of liquid water. On Pluto, the volume of liquid is even greater than the volume of habitable soil, air, and water we have here on Earth. So solvent, check. Trying to understand if nutrients are present? We Try and take a book by its cover to do this, or at least a world by its covering. 
The Cassini mission, which orbited Saturn, was able to observe geysers spraying material out of the icy shell of Enceladus. This material generally falls back down to the surface or escapes Enceladus to fill the rings of Saturn. But in one lucky pass, the mission was able to grab a bit of this material to feed into its mass spectrometer. In a new paper published in Nature Astronomy, researchers led by Jonah Peter do a statistical analysis of the detected materials and piece together a more complete picture of what molecules would have been present. They find the literal stuff of life, from water, carbon dioxide, and methane, and ammonia, to hydrogen cyanide, acetylene, propylene, and ethane. They're finding the kinds of organic molecules associated with the formation of life. As Peter explains, quote, the discovery of hydrogen cyanide was particularly exciting because it's the starting point for most theories on the origin of life. Life as we know it requires building blocks such as amino acids and hydrogen cyanide is one of the most important and versatile molecules needed to form amino acids, end quote. This means there are nutrients. And the fact that there is a liquid ocean beneath an ice shell tells us somewhere inside that world is a heat source, likely similar to the hydrothermal vents we have here on Earth. And there it is, the triumvirate of solvent, energy source, and nutrients. But that doesn't mean there is life. We still have no idea how easy or common it is for life to form. If we find none or all or even just some of these worlds with oceans also have life, that will allow us to start to understand what is the probability of life forming. Even if only one in 10 ocean-filled icy moons harbors life, that opens up a wide range of places in our universe where life could exist. According to a new paper in the Astrophysical Journal by Lene Quick, computer models now make it possible to predict what worlds outside our solar system may have the combination of density, distance from their star, and other factors that allow them to have an ice shell over an inner ocean. Of the planets they have modeled so far, they have been able to find several candidates. As Quick explains, quote, our analyses predict that these 17 worlds may have ice-covered surfaces but receive enough internal heating from the decay of radioactive elements and tidal forces from their host stars to maintain internal oceans. Thanks to the amount of internal heating they experience, all planets in our study could also exhibit cryovolcanic eruptions in the form of geyser-like plumes. End quote. Put another way, they have found 17 worlds that may act like Enceladus and could support the kind of life that is found around Earth's hydrothermal vents. We live in a terribly frustrating time. We know there are worlds capable of supporting life. We don't know if they do support life. And we can't yet create machinery capable of cutting through the ice shells of worlds like Europa and Enceladus and seeing what life might, may lie beneath. The best we can do is hope to capture droplets shot up in geysers and detect amino acids and maybe even DNA using orbiting spacecraft. According to new findings presented in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, researchers led by Sally Burke have shown unambiguous laboratory evidence that amino acids transported in these ice plumes can survive impact speeds up to 4.2 kilometers per second, supporting their detection during sampling by fast-moving spacecraft. This kind of sampling and detection just might be possible by the Europa Clipper after it reaches Europa in 2030. Science is a long game, a terribly frustrating long game. Hopefully in my lifetime we will know just how common life is in our solar system 
and we can begin to dream of intelligent life out beyond our solar system. The kinds of life many of us hope to find within our solar system likely won't be all that intellectual. Those maybe microbes on Mars might be able to respond to food or pain, but that's not speech. There just might be life as dynamic as the shrimp we see at hydrothermal vents lurking in the depths of an icy ocean moon, but shrimp also aren't known for their speeches. And as much as we may joke about space whales, it is hard to imagine social animals evolving in the cold darkness of these moons, but let's just imagine it is possible for a moment. Could we talk to space whales? It seems like a good starting point is to ask, can we talk to our whales? Maybe. According to new research published in Peer J and led by Brenda McCowan, researchers have recorded conversations between humpback whales and been able to replicate a conversation using these recordings. Specifically, they put out a standard contact call and a nearby whale called Twain, responded in a standard way. They responded with a canned response, a lot like a chat bite might do when you call your credit card company. And the whale initially responded, but did lose interest. Again, kind of like you might when you realize you're talking to a bot and not a human. While researchers like chatbots are responding by following a pattern rather than by knowing exactly what they are saying, this is still a start to communications and implies that maybe someday we'll be able to communicate at least as well as ChatGPT. I'm still not sure if that is for good or for evil, but this is where we are, and I guess being a chatbot is better than nothing. Next up, I'm pleased to welcome on aerospace correspondent Eric Mattis for this week's Tales from the Launchpad. Hey, Eric. Hi, Pamela. The big space news this week was supposed to be the launch of the United States Space Force's X-37 space plane atop of Falcon Heavy. But well, space is hard, and as of when we're recording this, it's still on the ground in Florida. Instead, there was a third launch of China's Zhukui-2 rocket on December 8th. Made by the Chinese company Landspace, the Zuk-A2 is the first rocket to reach orbit powered by liquid methane and oxygen out of a packed race of half a dozen-ish competitors, including ULA's Vulcan and SpaceX's Starship, a feat it achieved back in July after failing its inaugural launch about a year ago. The third launch was considered the first operational mission and carried real payloads. The three Payloads were technology demonstration satellites for a Chinese company and a Chinese university. Two of them will test new Argon ion engines through 10,000 starts and stops. The other satellite from Henan University of Science and Technology will demonstrate a new camera, space power supply, and control software, among other things. The launch from the Chiochen Satellite Launch Center, where China also launches their crewed missions, was successful. Let's watch the launch. Other than Zuk-2, the only other launches were another two batches of Starlink satellites, one from each coast by SpaceX, and a Chinese Yaogan reconnaissance satellite atop a Long March 2D. We keep track of orbital launches by launch site, also called Spaceport. According to RocketLaunch.Live, so far this year, the USA has had 102 launches, China 59, India, Kazakhstan, and Russia each have had 8, New Zealand 6, French Guiana, Japan, and North Korea each have had 3, and Iran, Israel, South Korea, and the United Kingdom each have had 1. Of these 205 launches, there have been 8 failures, reminding us that space is hard. Thanks, Eric. 
Before we go, I'd like to let you know that astronaut Frank Rubio has been exonerated in the case of the missing tomatoes. During Rubio's record-setting 371 days in space, his work included tending the first tomatoes to successfully fruit in space. After picking the literal fruits of his labors, he, as many of us would do, put them in a Ziploc bag and set them down. The problem is, he put them down on the chaotic ISS and was utterly unable to find them later. It had been presumed by many that he had simply eaten the little red delights. Sadly, such consumption was forbidden because these weren't just any tomatoes. They were space tomatoes. And everything from the structure of their flesh to the hardiness of their seeds was future science in the making. Unable to produce the forbidden produce, a red mark went in Rubio's otherwise pristine record. But that all changed when the squished and mummified tomato remains were found. And that is it for now. Good night, everyone. And remember to go out and look up. Thank you.